Thanks a lot for coming. We're looking forward to a profitable day. Hope you enjoy yourself. Jim? Thank you, John. Profitable day? <laughs> <laughs> the money theme. The, the money theme. Yeah. Let me just go back up. Um, thank you. I recognize quite a few faces here. There's quite a few faces I don't recognize. So those that do know me, Tom, you know I'll be calling it on you to help me out, right? <laughs> because there's lots of people with wisdom in this room, and Kevin Langan, and I saw it with Glenn Westendorf. So uh, because this is an interactive type day, it really is important to draw on the on the experiences you've all had and, and share those lessons. Now, am I talking loud enough at the back? Good, okay. So, John just touched lightly on, on why the pricing matter. And so, so, the balance of the morning, and we're not rushed for time, uh, but we are gonna focus on the primer. And you've now all got copies. And the co-authors of that primer are Oliver Brandis, and you saw this smiling photograph already. And you'll see, I think you caught a flash of, of Kurt's picture a moment ago. Today really is significant from, from Oliver and, and Kurt's point of view because what they've tried to do is really um, start a national dialogue uh, on, the, on this whole issue of, of pricing and sustainable infrastructure. And, and so today is, is, a, is a significant workshop in terms of the format being a blend of research and practice. And that's why it's so important to have these interactive parts, which is why you know they'll, they'll, they'll give us a, les a, a lesson, right? You'll, go, you'll, you'll explain the primer and you are open to questions during that time. But in addition to that, we have the first of what we call the three town hall sessions where we will get you all sharing your experience. And so that's where we're going. Setting the scene for sustainable service delivery. And, and we thought a lot about this, about the, uh, how, how to title the, the workshop. And so on the one hand, yes, it is about uh, conservation-oriented water pricing, but it's all getting us to a, to a bigger end. And so the, the bigger end or the larger picture is this whole question of sustainable service for, uh, delivery. And uh, if you've all been reading the material that's posted on the, on the Water Bucket website, and you all have, right, because that was your homework in preparation for today, you know, there are some gems in terms of quotes. And so we had one Oliver Brandis quote, and uh, we picked this as probably one of your more pithy quotes for the purpose of this workshop, right? Water pricing is a hot issue in communities across the country. And what Kirk will actually bring to this discussion today, uh, Kirk Stinchcomb, is really, shall I say, the international perspective as well as the Canadian and the British Columbia perspective, because you have, what, a decade in Australia? So you, you, you were there, you've been there through their, uh, their learning period and you know dealing with real droughts, not, not like our droughts, which are, okay, we've had three or four months. <laughs> There's what, how many? Seven or eight years? <laughs> So there's that perspective, but also, um, uh, Kirk, you were one of the uh, part of the Living Water Smart team. So I guess uh, some of those uh, action items, which are, have a, a water pricing or conservation-related uh, theme, probably you had some hand in crafting it? Right, okay. So I think that's all I'm gonna say to kind of set the scene, because I'm assuming that you and Oliver are gonna elaborate on your experience and what's relevant to this audience, and they're gonna be a tag team, because they've got 55 minutes, uh, and, they, and they know they've got to keep you entertained, so they are going to go back and forth. I'm not sure yet who's the straight man and who's the funny guy, but we'll learn very quickly, right? So, thank you. Um, all right, so let me do the same check. Can the chair in the cheap seats back there? Good? Like, good or okay? Good. So a um, couple of questions to start off with. Uh, how many of you, not where you work, where you live, how many of you live in an area that, how many of you have meters in front of your house? Uh, quite a few, okay, how, sorry, how many don't? So I'd say probably 50, 50, yeah? And so correspondingly, how many of you pay for water by volume? And not by volume? Again, about the same, and it's usually about the same, because if you've got a meter, usually it's by volume. How many of you think you're paying too much for your water? I was hoping one person would be brave enough. <laughs> okay, Kurt, I, I, I pay too much for my water. <laughs> All right, not one person here. All right, so we've got it. Uh, we're preaching to the choir here. Oh, that's good. Um, all right, and how many of you have what we would call finance backgrounds? So you either work in finance or um, you have training in finance? Okay, quite a few, good. 
Um, we're, we're going to say some things that will be interesting to you folks today, but we're also definitely here to speak to the people that didn't have their hands up on the last question. So where's my clicker? How do I work it? Where's John? <laughs> Okay, so this is here to introduce me and Oliver. Um, so uh, a couple of things come out of it. Right? Uh, first of all, who I am. So my, I'm a consultant. My company is called Econix, and I do water conservation work primarily. Um, but I'm also a quote, special advisor uh, to the Polis Project, which is where Oliver comes from. And Oliver phoned me, uh, I don't know, six months or eight months ago and said, we've got to do a primer on pricing. Why? No one wants to talk about pricing. And he twisted my arm for, well, a couple of weeks, I suppose, and finally got me to agree to it. And I'm glad, I'm really glad I did. And we'll talk about it more in a second. Um, so Oliver and I are going to tag team on this. And um, I'll just make a couple things clear. So if this is dumb and dumber, I'm dumber. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, my job in this whole project has been to simplify things that economists and finance people say so that everyone else can understand. Um, so Oliver is dumb, and uh, but I mean, he's not dumber because he has one advantage over me in that he is actually an economist. So uh, my background is more in marketing and, and, um, and things like that. So my perspective is more on how do we communicate to people, right? So the hard bits, Oliver is going to do. We fortunately had a, a third author on the project, um, Stephen Ranzetti, who is probably Canada's foremost water economist, uh, working out of uh, Brock University in Ontario. Um, and so he's the smart guy in the whole mix, and a lot of what's in here is sort of his thinking that we've translated, I guess. Do you want anything about what you are? Yeah, I just, I guess for, for today's session, you know, we've uh, done this presentation, we've each taken the lead, made the presentation, but in today's context, what I am hoping to bring to it is a little bit of the technical, but I don't want us to get lost in the technical, but at the same time to offer, and I guess, I'm a sports fan, so I get to be the John Madden, the color commentator. I get to make slightly irreverent comments here and there from the side. And I, what I hope to do is to really identify, this is a very deep, thick field. I know because we did some background research and I filled the whole bookshelf with the materials that are here. So we're not going to get everything. This is going to be a shallow wall through a deep pond. But I'm hoping that I can identify a couple issues that might be real points of emphasis. And it's not just about pricing, but it's what this project, what, why are you pricing, to what end? The idea that it's already been introduced by Kim and by John, the idea that it's about a larger goal, whether it's sustainable infrastructure, whether it's sustainable financing, whether it's about conservation to keep watersheds healthy and functioning. That's part of the objective. And I want us, that'll be my role, is to kind of pull us back and not get lost too much in some of those details, because that's what we're, our objective ultimately is. So um, Kim already talked about the project mission a little bit, but again, it's really to, to get this national dialogue going about pricing, right? To get people starting to talk about pricing as a way to get people to change the way they use water. And well, why is that? Well, um, you know, for those that can't read it in the back, the tagline on this cartoon, I'm right there in the room and no one even acknowledges me, right? That's pricing. Pricing is the elephant in the room. So we talk about uh, when we're talking about water conservation, we're, we're happy to talk about toilet rebates, and we're happy to talk about teaching kids in classrooms, and we're happy even to talk about watering restrictions, where we're imposing penalties on people when they use water at the wrong time. But we tend to shy away from talking about using price, even though in the back of our minds, many of us have this idea that, hey, that could actually be a pretty powerful instrument. So we're going to talk about you know, the sort of logistics around it, but we're also going to spend a lot of time talking about um, the communications and the marketing and the politics of it. So the people that had their hands up when I said you have a finance background, that's maybe where this will be more useful for you folks. And really at the end of this whole session, there's three things that I want you to take away. I want you to understand hopefully what it is and roughly how it works. I want you to understand that there are others in other places and folks in this room using it and using it successfully. And the third and I think most important piece is I want you to understand that there are issues. It isn't a silver bullet, it isn't an easy answer, but the challenges aren't um, unovercomable. They are barriers, but there are ways to resolve them. So again, that'll be something that I'll sort of emphasize a few times as we go through. That the, the 
it's a real opportunity and it's something that we're seeing certainly if you look at the trends elsewhere and the places that are facing the real hard issues, the seven year droughts of the world that we haven't yet faced but may one day be coming and we need to start thinking about these problems differently. Okay, so let's, let's get into it. Let's start with um, a little bit of like, you know, the, the technical. So what is it? Fundamentally, uh, when you simplify conservation oriented pricing, it's got three elements. So the first thing is that the cost of providing the service are recovered. And ideally they're fully recovered. And we're gonna dig into what that means a little bit more. So you're getting your costs now and in the future, and you're getting all of your costs. Second thing is that metered, uh, customers are metered and paid for the volume they use, and that's probably obvious stuff to everyone in this room and why I asked the questions at the beginning. And then the third bit is probably the hardest bit, and that is that the price is sufficient to affect individual decision making. And so that's why I asked the question, how many of you think you pay too much for water? And none of you can hear that. So uh, related, so what does water do? Uh, what does the price of water do? Um, it provides revenue to the water service providers so that they can do the things that they do. It provides a financial incentive for customers to use water more efficiently. Um, and as a related uh, corollary, it provides information about their water use. They're getting data about what they're doing, how much they're using, what their meters do. And it promotes innovation. And so what do we mean by, does that make sense to everybody it promotes innovation? Right. What we mean by that is, you know, if, if people are paying more for water, they're going to go out and buy more efficient gear, like washing machines or toilets or whatever. Manufacturers are going to follow by getting more creative with how, with, um, with how the technology is uh, developed. So taking that kind of uh, context into consideration, let's look where we stand now in Canada on, um, on those criteria. I should pause right now and say one thing uh, that's an important distinction that we call, we talk about uh, water pricing in the guide, and I'll use that terminology a lot, but bear in mind that we're not actually talking about the price of water. We're not talking about the price of the substance itself. We're talking about the services to provide the water, and it's an important distinction. There's, there's a lot of water in the world. The challenge is getting the water into people's homes through dams and pipes and treatment plants and all the rest of it. So it's the pricing of the services that we're really talking about. Does that distinction make sense to everybody? Yeah. So, you know, and, and there's a political, heated political debate behind that around the commodification of water and the substance. We're not talking about that. That's a different issue. Okay, so uh, this graph is in the primer and you can have a look at it in more detail there. Um, and so the, this is one of these, this is how you test your audience. You put this graph up and you see one of three reactions, either sort of the eyes roll back and you sort of slump in sort of half sleep stupor, <laughs> or you get really angry and you turn bright red, or you kind of look and you think, hmm, what are the bats for? And the angry people get mad because they say, listen, you're trying to compare a bunch of different countries and you can't compare. Water use in Canada is totally different than England and the water use in Germany, very different. What we want to emphasize here is not the details of the data, and that's my other existence is I have legal training, so I have all the, many caveats, addendums, and footnotes, so I don't want us to get caught up in the data details here, but I want to demonstrate a relationship, and I think we're all aware of it, and John sort of alluded to it. The dark line here represents the price of water for roughly the same thing, residential water use calculated slightly differently in different places. The blue line represents consumption. You can see in Canada, we don't charge very much, but we consume a great deal. But what's interesting to me is not just that fact, it's the fact that this relationship is like a big X. So what we see is the more you charge for water, the less you use. And that's what's important. Not getting caught up in the, in the data details, but recognizing this relationship exists that there is an actual behavior change that happens when you change the price. And this relationship, we use international as a good proxy, but this relationship holds up on a whole bunch of different scales. We've done some preliminary research where we've looked at some different places across Canada and across the US, even in neighborhoods where they're charging different prices for roughly the same sort of product, the water use, 
we see changing behavior. And I think that's not surprising, but for some folks, that's a step. And this is an important piece of the evidence to show that that relationship exists. That there's a relationship between how much you charge and how much you use. And the way I sort of describe it, and I would never do this in a room full of economists, but price is one of the best adult education tools out there. When we think about going to our wallet, that's what will get an adult to think differently about how they behave. There's very few other things that can actually help educate adults. But this is one of the important tools to do that. OK, so taking my <coughs> earlier simplification of uh, um, the prerequisites and simplifying it further, meter use, charge volumetrically, sufficiently high rate. Let's talk about the first one, metering. Um, these stats are probably familiar to most people in the room, so I'll blast through them. In Canada, last time we had data available, 63% of uh, homes have a water meter. And we're talking standalone homes, so it's not on uh, multi res requirement. This is houses. But lots of um, uh, disparity across the country in terms of metering rates. So Saskatchewan, in the urban context, is mostly metered. So is Ontario and Manitoba. Um, BC, comes in uh, around 35%, 36%, I believe, if I remember correctly. Not great, um, but we're not the worst. Um, Quebec is lower at about 16%, and in Newfoundland, only a few homes, like actually a, a, a handful of homes have meters. So we're kind of in the middle, back half of the pack. Um, I will say the situation's changing over time, and um, uh, we're getting better in um, places like Kamloops are moving rapidly into metering. That'll change the stats over time and um, lots of places in the lower mainland have voluntary programs uh, and, are, and or are thinking about metering. So uh, we're going to see that kind of continue to change over time. Um, so that's metering. How do we fare in terms of volume based charging? Um, well the stats on metering tend to correlate with the stats on volume based charging. So if you've got a meter, you tend to get charged by volume. So um, again, about a third of Canadian homes still pay for water based on a flat rate. Flat rate, why is that a problem? Well, you know, it's the all-you-can-eat buffet phenomenon. So hence the picture, right? You have no incentive to conserve because uh, you pay the same regardless uh, of how much you use. And once again, that's that point of there is a relationship between price and behavior, and it demonstrates really well in this example Flat rate payers generally use about 43% more water. So if you're on a flat rate, you use about 470 liters per person per day. If you're paying by volume, you use about 266. So a significantly less amount when you have that signal. Again, that signal that gives you an incentive either to change your behavior, change your technology, think about the problem in a different way. Um, but, you know, again, uh, improving over time. So uh, that's... Uh, this is um, Environment Canada data, and you know we've gone from from there to there, so we're getting better in terms of charging volumetrically. So that's good. Excuse me. Yeah. In Quebec, is there any behavior changes happening because of uh, information and education about conservation? Uh, I don't really know um, what the stats are on Quebec's consumption over there. I, I just looked at that because it was abysmal. Yeah. And if you know, one of the arguments is you put your money into education and, and maybe affect change of behavior. There is no conclusive work. evidence of that. There's definitely, it depends on the level of commitment. There's a bunch of reasons why Quebec's problematic. One of the big water users, Quebec City and Montreal, they're amongst the first places in Canada that got uh, settled and developed. They have really, really old infrastructure. So a place like Montreal loses up to 40% in leakage. So a significant amount. So you can do great education programming. That's not going to help you <laughs> resolve that problem. So there's a, there's a bunch of stuff bundled there. I think it's a great question. You're basically asking, what's the better education program? And my argument is the price is one element in an education program. I don't think that they have demonstrated in any conclusive or comprehensive way that that is not pricing is the way to go. What they've done is, again, depending on the situation, resolve some problems in different ways. But they have significant concerns. OK, so um, is this me or you? Or? This one's you. OK, so uh, this is a, a, a variation on the slide that Oliver showed earlier, but it's more recent data. So um, just in terms of 
getting into the question of meaningful price, uh, again, you see here we've got you know comparable countries. There's England and Wales. There's um, Australia. There's New Zealand. There, uh, you know, so you know France. So broadly comparable countries in terms of lifestyle and so on. Obviously, there's differences, but you know, here's Canada right at the back of the pack behind places like Korea, Spain, uh, Czech Republic lowest water and wastewater prices of any of these studies, any country study in an OECD study. So this is fairly solid data. And beyond this, this again goes to the point, because we don't know what the magic number, you're gonna turn around and say, well, okay guys, you guys are so smart, tell us what, what's the right price for water? We don't know, it depends on the situation. The point though is, in Canada, we know we're not close. We have a long ways to go, and this is another piece of that evidence to show, listen, there's a long way and there's uh, many opportunities related to that. Um, and even when you look at it in terms of disposable income, what we find is that, again, Canada's right near the back of the pack, not dead last when it comes to disposable income, but close. So here's Canada here. And basically what this means is that we're spending 0.3% of our disposable income on water and wastewater. So not very much. So the argument that some people, I think it'd be a tough argument for many people to, to say, listen, I think I'm paying too much. 0.3%. Uh, but again, we are improving over time when it comes to uh, pricing. So when I say improving over time, some other people might say that's not improving. Water's getting more expensive, but I think that's improving. And so you can see here, uh, again, Environment Canada data, price for 25 cubic meters a month, it's sort of gradually ratcheting up. Isn't that, isn't that uh, compared to the cost of providing it, as opposed to what you can just get for the bucket of water? Yeah, the, we're going to talk about that more, yeah, because that's just great, that's just what you're caught paying for the bucket of water. Mm -hmm. Good. Very important question. I think it's an important question, and we'll just take a minute to, to emphasize that because what we're suggesting, if once you, so, the whole package here, we're trying to you know give you the foundation <coughs> pieces is that in essence, what we're doing is we're subsidizing our water use. We're subsidizing it in a variety of ways, whether it's general tax, whether it's actually running down the ecosystem by overconsuming or not accounting for some of the impacts. But there is a subsidy. So what we're talking about with that sort of stepwise pro progression is sort of untangling some of that subsidy, but we're not nearly getting there fast enough. So some of these problems will manifest very soon. From a philosophical point of view, are you taking the tack that, like the argument about the world price of oil, so we all have to pay more for oil, are you saying the world price, we should get to a world price for water? I don't think there's a uniform price. Again, this is my idea that I'm not suggesting that we, we sort of secretly have the magic number and it's going to be, you know, $2.36. No, but in that case, it's the oil companies that are driving that. Yeah, and they may well be doing that. Okay. <laughs> it's a different creature because I think what we're talking about is something that's in context. So the price, you know, here versus the watershed over versus the mainland versus Ontario are all very different issues. But I think what should uh, sort of instill your decision ultimately is the same. You need to think about things like how is your infrastructure being financed? How is it going to last? What's the appropriate capacity for a given watershed? What's the social sort of atmosphere like? What's appropriate use for water? What's not? These are some of the criteria. What the ultimate price in each of these places will be very different. So there isn't a world price. And, and again, it's the difference between the price of water and the price of providing water services. Right? That's the distinction. Yeah, and that's, I understand that. Yeah. So is there a breakdown inside that data for, well, I'm not down with the question, for the, the way that you treat water? So a place that has to highly treat the water, a place that has wells or the UV, um, are we going to start to see those numbers so that when a municipality is doing a comparison, the one that has to do the highest treating isn't comparing their water rate to someone who sucks it out of a well and has to do nothing. Are we going to start to see some of those numbers inside this, this kind of data? I don't think you're going to find that right now in Canada. Mm -hmm. I don't think you'll find that anywhere. We're a well, this is the you know the premise, right? We want to start this dialogue. It's kind of like religion, sex, and politics. We never seem to talk about this stuff. Well, why don't we talk about water? I don't know because these issues are going to be real, and we don't we can't answer these questions. So that to me is a huge signal of the problem: the fact that we can't begin to have that conversation. That it's just that simple. That someone says, you know, he's paying more or paying less than I am, and that's not fair. Well, 
w why and what's the part? And that's what we're trying to sort of address, and as I'm sure you are too. Here. Okay, so we should keep rolling through this intro stuff. So, does this is this you know like this picture is probably obvious to most people. You know, like in some context, we're willing to pay a lot more for water than we do pay you know for the stuff that comes out of our taps. So it's just that it's a question of context. Right? You know, like we'll pay whatever the stats are. You know, a thousand times more for this water than we will for the stuff that comes out of our top. So in some context, we're willing to pay a lot more clearly. Uh, obviously, we wouldn't be watering our lawns with this stuff, but you know, I think it's still a point to make. Okay, so summing up kind of all the, the stuff that we're talking about in terms of meaningful price. So the price is meaningful. Um, if the price is correct and therefore meaningful, people will change their behavior. When we talk about behavioral changes, two things, the way they use water, and the decisions they make when they buy stuff that use it more. So those are both behaviors because they know it'll save them money. Let's talk about a tale of two cities. But we'll start with the tale of two washing machines. These are very similar washing machines, okay, in many ways. They're both manufactured by Amana, which is a, uh, a lower end major uh, national manufacturer or retailer, uh, brand I should say. Um, they're both white. They both have the same capacity. One is a top loader. One is a front loader. This one uses over 100 liters per load. This one uses less than 50. There's a price difference that corresponds. This one is uh, $428 plus HST at Home Depot. This one is $748 at Home Depot. Okay. This is me and Oliver. <laughs> I live in Esquimalt in the Sierra, in the <coughs> Victoria. Oliver lives in Sandwich. We both get our water from the exact same place, Super Reservoir. Oliver's house is 3.2 kilometers from mine. I measured it on Google Earth last night. I thought you were out there with a big. No. We have very comparable demographics. Three people in the house both have uh, a toddler. To it. Is your kid walking in, Oliver? No. Okay. Well, still are we close? Still using lots of uh, water for washing clothes. They're both older homes. We both pay the exact same thing for our electricity from BC Hydro, six cents per kilowatt. Um, the difference is in what we pay for water, okay? just because of the way that our water rates are structured by our municipalities. So because I live in Esquimalt, I pay 90 cents for my water per cubic meter, but I pay nothing for wastewater. It's built into my property tax. So my combined rate is 90 cents per cubic meter. Oliver is being charged volumetrically for his wastewater. So we're paying pretty close to the same thing for water. Uh, you're paying, you know, a little bit more, but a lot more for wastewater. So his, his total rate is double water. Right? That's just not fair to say though. You, you gotta put your tax component down there. Mm -hmm. But in but terms of in terms of what I'm talking about, in terms of payback, no, I, I understand what you're getting, but just the words, how it, you word it, I don't think that's fair. Okay, you know what? That's an absolutely fair point. I'm not paying nothing for wastewater. Right. That's your point, right? Exactly. Yes. So absolutely fair point. I am paying for wastewater, but it's built into my property taxes. Mm -hmm. Totally fair point. But still, you know, my point is when I'm going to make purchase decisions. It's a different context for me and Oliver. Because yeah, no, I, I, I agree. Your higher assessment home is the one who's losing hold on your system. That's right. Thank you for a point. So here, you know, here's the punchline. Right? The payback period on that washing machine, um, on this washing machine, looking at the marginal cost, so the extra cost of buying the better machine in terms of water efficiency, is you know almost double. And that's factoring in energy costs, by the way, in terms of the hot water. Right. So, uh, does that help in, in contextualize a list a little bit in terms of what this actually means on the ground when we're making purchasing decisions? And it's a big difference because this is a true story. I have one of those washing machines, not just because I care about water, but because I did the calculus. I thought, you know what, it really makes sense for me. Kirk really does have that. I've checked his basement. He has this outdated thing. I'm like, haven't you spent a career doing water stuff? And he's like, yeah, but i got to spend my limited bucks on stuff and this isn't it. It doesn't make sense. We're changing the dynamic of 
what is being bought and the innovation that goes behind it. Front-loading washing machines don't just appear. They're a function of time. It takes time to develop that technology. So if we're talking about water technologies, that innovation component becomes critically important. That's right. In my defense, I haven't been in toilet. <laughs> uh, oh, it's getting personal. <laughs> Moving on. Um, okay, so uh, so that's looking at it from kind of the consumer's perspective. So let's look at it from the water service provider's perspective. Uh, the other impacts associated with water underpricing, which starts to get at what you, I think, were asking about with your, the question behind your question, is you know we got all these things that happen. Some of them are environmental, and some of them are financial. So we got higher operating costs. Uh, when, we're, when we're using excess water, you know, we're pumping and treating more water than we need to, higher capital costs, and then the Im environmental impacts that we're probably all familiar with. Um, but there's a couple of other bits. You know, there's fairness issues, so there's social issues. Those who waste water or use more than they need to are paying the same or similar to those who conserve. Okay? Um, and innovation stifled, as we're going to talk about earlier. And then there's the problem of infrastructure. Right. Give me the good picture. Oh, you got a couple. Got a one. So the, the big issue here is to understand that in our current state, what we have is a couple problems going on. We have underfunded water, arguably. And what that results in is a few things. We see this overconsumption. We also see a really critical piece, and that's the sort of hidden problem, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, but certainly as a society we are not. And that's somebody somewhere is paying for this stuff. And if they're not, it's because the infrastructure itself is eroding. And there's some implications of that. There's these kinds of problems, and even better yet, I'm going to wait for the, the, for the really good one. These kinds of problems. And that is something that we are now in Canada approaching that period where the last sort of really significant infrastructure period was about 50 years ago, which is about the life expectancy of a lot of this kinds of infrastructure. So that reality is coming home to roost. And so if you want to flip the slide one more time, in a less entertaining way, this graph captures that relationship. So on the top line, we have the total expenditure on water, and that correlates with this axis. So that black line represents total expenditure. Now, one click. the dotted line represents what we're getting in sales. And you can see that there's a gap between there, so we're not recovering the cost. Give me another click. And that is the rate or the missing piece of that cost is represented in this line, and that's over here. What we have in 2007 is recovering 70%. So we're shortfall of 30% right now. 2007 is the latest data. Now we'll see probably a little spike because of our recent bout of stimulus spending, but you can see this sort of cyclical waving kind of approach. We're only in about 2001 where we close. So over the last, what's that, 20 years, one year we've been close to covering our costs. That has significant repercussions. It helps us understand why our price may not be appropriate. And more importantly, it alludes to what may be a bigger problem, which is that previous slide. Kirk and I debated on whether the fire engine slide comes before or after. But it would be nice for you to see it again to understand that's where the future of some of our infrastructure may be going. And understanding that that missing 30% does come from a variety of places. <coughs> there are some transfers that happen within government, or within the local government, which you're aware of. Obviously, some comes from senior government, which is a very important component. But the reality, and we're seeing this now as government is facing, senior government is facing a new um, fiscal reality, the role of that kind of infrastructure funding will change. So this alludes again to what we might want to think about. And it really emphasizes the point that I think that we need to make. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. When will the water prices and the water sales recovery cover those kinds of expenditures? It may still be 10 years away, but it's coming. And the more lead time you have to think about it, which we'll go into detail now, is will give you the best opportunity to address that problem. The days where senior government you know, feds, provinces, have the freedom of money to spend on some of these sort of projects will diminish. So, somewhere along that line, someone's gonna pay for it. And the challenge is to get ahead of the curve, not let the curve sort of capture you. 
just yep. just a point on your expenditures there as well is the the type of expenditure it's changing as well Absolutely. because of the environmental considerations yep. and regulation that exists. So how we delivered the service before is becoming very different. So that the expenditures should be going up just for that reason. And, yep. and your graph there showed a, a decline when, when our costs of doing the same thing like a distribution line is and how we treat our water is going way up. Exactly. Right. And, and, the cost. and the cost recovery corresponding. Like I Victoria, when you deal with your wastewater properly, imagine what your costs are going to be. I think you're alluding to exactly that's the tip of the iceberg. There's dozens of these things. Mm -hmm. Source protection, regulation costs, enforcement costs, all these things. And that, that's not even remotely caught in here. So what we're, that graph really shows the sort of best case scenario and it looks pretty grim. It's only going to get bigger, that gap. Right, and that's where you're saying to me anyways that, um, that you're covering many of the costs in different ways. For example, environmental damage would would be coming out of some taxation bucket and not out of. Well, or I'm, I probably would further suggest that some of these we aren't doing. So we're seeing right. this deficit, whether it's an actual infrastructure deficit, whether it's a sort of called an agency deficit, where the agencies aren't having enough revenue, so you're losing human capital, financial capital or whether it's an ecosystem deficit because some of these systems are degrading. These deficits will become very real in the not so distant future. In fact, we see evidence of that happening. But again, I'm the marketer, so let's simplify this, right? Two key points, not recovering enough money to pay for the service, having environmental impact from excess of use, right? Environmental economic. So uh, let's talk about how you so if we're all like, yeah, okay, I agree with all that. Let's talk about how you can do something about it, how you could set up a set go about setting up a system. So whoops. Um, so the first question you've got to ask yourself is how much revenue do you need? <clears throat> and that's an important starting point. And when we ask how much revenue we need, what we are talking about is the concept of full cost accounting. How many people are familiar with that term, full cost accounting? Okay, yeah, all right. Third of us. What, what we mean when we say full cost accounting is that you're capturing all the costs uh, that you're incurring and reflecting those in your price. So that includes all the obvious stuff like OPEX and CAPEX and depreciation and uh, overhead and regulatory costs and some all the stuff you're talking about. In fact, this gets right to your point. Um, but we're also talking about sometimes including what we call soft costs, which are things like environmental externalities, so uh, watershed protection, uh, the costs of uh, rehabilitating, uh, aquatic ecosystems that may be affected by disposal, right? Those kinds of things, soft costs. Even in a more direct way, things like source protection, right? Not that long ago, we just assumed we could do whatever we wanted in the source and we could just sort of fix the problem when it came sort of to us. But we're now seeing, and there's lots of evidence, the, the big one that everyone uses is, you know, New York, the Catskills, they decided that it would be cheaper then building a big sophisticated treatment plant is to spend the money on getting people, farmers, and activities change of behavior up in the source protection. So they recognize that protecting the water before it sort of hit the system was more important and a better use of dollars than, than spending the money on the treatment end of things. And that was reinforced by the Justice O'Connor inquiry, which related to the Walkerton events. And Ontario has really sort of addressed that issue in an aggressive way, and I think that sort of like, you know, like a pond dropping the stone, the ripples are coming and we're see feeling it all across the country and in fact around the world. Yeah, so, um, and uh, I'm not going to get into this, but for those of the financial uh, ilk, uh, we're also talking about, um, when you're capturing costs, we're also talking about marginal costs as opposed to historical costs, so it's future costs as well. Uh, but I won't go into that in any more detail, there's a, a bit of stuff on the prime, in the primer on that. A good case study on full, uh, full cost uh, accounting is actually capital regional districts. So the CRD itself, not the municipal water service providers, uh, uh, retailers, I should say. But the CRD has actually uh, done a pretty decent job in terms of local context with full cost accounting. Admittedly, again, for the financial types, they do it on a historical or average cost basis as opposed to a marginal cost basis. But they're still capturing lots of their costs, including, interestingly, the cost of watershed because in the CRD, they own the watershed, right? They purchased the area around Soup Reservoir and maintain that land, and so that's included in their costs, right? So you can kind of see how those soft costs become incorporated there. Um, and 
you know, there's uh, a few papers around on CRD's approach that are available for those. <coughs> um, so it, uh, when we're talking about uh, um, cost recovery and spending, it's not just the price, but um, the, the total amount spent that's important, but it's also the way that your pricing is structured. So I think uh, we'll, whoops. So there's a couple of concepts in here that are important. One is the concept of price elasticity, and the other one is the uh, concept of pricing structure. And so I think I'll throw that. That's hard. Economic stuff. You want to bring up the next slide so we can? Yeah. I'm sure that in the uh, package you got the word instructions. I assume some of you brought calculators with you because this is the part that's a bit more interactive. So maybe we can get together and work together. We're just going to do some simple derivative calculus to help us figure out. <laughs> and the reality is, we're not going to do that. But we want you to understand the relationship here. And there is a relationship. We've talked about it before. Price goes up, demand goes down. The sensitivity is what is elasticity. That's the elasticity of price. If price goes up in increment, what percent of that increment will it go down? Now that's the challenge that most people are facing because in some cases, if you don't design it right, you raise the price, demand goes down too much. You're not covering your revenue anymore. You're running into problems. So this is an important concept and something you're gonna need someone with technical details to help you figure out, which isn't me by the way, but there are the kinds of groups that can do that. Many people have that capacity. But there is a, a couple important points we wanna think about. One is outdoor versus indoor. So number one, in Canada, a number of studies have demonstrated that outdoor water use is actually very elastic, which means you increase the price a little bit, <coughs> your demand actually goes down quite a bit. So that's an important design consideration. Your indoor use is fairly inelastic, meaning price goes up a little bit, demand hardly changes. Not surprising, I'm not gonna change how I use the toilet, or how I'm going to brush my teeth, or how much laundry I'm going to do based on this. So I'm a bit, in, in short. bit stuck. But there's a distinction, short term versus long term. And once again, in the short term, it may be generally more inelastic, meaning price goes up, uh, uh, the reduction goes down a very little bit. But in the long term, we see much more significant change, much closer to what they call unitary. So as it goes up, the same amount will go down. And what's happening? People are replacing the technologies. They're making some of those decisions and changing some of those factors that they can control. All that to say is there is a relationship. Price goes up, demand goes down. How much it goes down depends on exactly the context you're talking about. There's lots of details in there about some of these meta studies where some of this work has been done. But it also plays a role in when you start thinking about who you're going to price and how much and what your end goal is. <coughs> if you're thinking about getting people to really reduce their outdoor use, let's say you have a real peak factor kind of concern, you think about a seasonal surcharge, it is going to give you that bang for your buck. But if you're thinking about something else like changing the way indoor or residential use is, you're going to think about the program in a very different way because you have to think about that short term versus long term kind of issue. So I hope that technical aside is somewhat useful without going into too much more detail. If you want to discuss price elasticities, Kirk will be available at lunch. <laughs> <laughs> well, in fact, I can, I can cover it off right now. Kind of complicated. Page 12, get help. <laughs> like, seriously, this is probably the hardest area of all of this stuff. And if you, if you don't have the internal capacity in your organization to deal with that question, uh, it may be an area where you need help, external help from people that do this stuff for a living, not me. Um, but it's not impossible to get your head around. It's as complicated as we get in this discussion. Uh, okay, so some other stuff that you gotta think about when you're setting the rates. You gotta think about, so some of it's economic or financial, some of it's uh, political. Um, so uh, what do you got currently in place? What's your history like? Can your business systems handle it? Can your, can your IT systems handle what you wanna do? Um, how are you gonna communicate it? the residents, and we're going to talk about that more. Marginal cost of supplying water, this is another kind of more complicated area that we don't go into. There is a section in the primer on marginal cost versus average cost pricing, which have a look at. Uh, and, you know, impact on the community, we'll talk about that more too. Particularly vulnerable groups. Um, so, I think this stuff's going to be obvious to people here, so I won't spend much time on it. 
when you set your rate, you're going to have two parts. Typically, you're going to have a connection charge and a per unit charge, which adds up to your total bill. Uh, the connection charge um, can be in different places, and so this goes to your point earlier about, well, you're still paying for wastewater charge. Yes, I am. Um, uh, Mike, you're going to be talking a little bit about how it's structured in Nanaimo, you know, how the difference between these two things is structured, but fundamentally, it's kind of boiled down to this simple formula. Does that and make sense, everybody? I mean, just even a head nod, just so we get the sense of it. Because this is, it's a simple idea, but it's sort of layered on a bunch of stuff, so we want to make sure that everyone's sort of coming along for the ride at this point, because it's the balance. I, th I think, though, it's important to say that you can really vary those. Like, there's a good argument whether you should just have variable charge that's right. and get rid of the connection charge. And that's, that's I'm glad you're here. <laughs> um, that's precisely the point. later on that one. <laughs> you keep catching the stuff that I miss. That's good. I don't think pay you off later. The, um, some places have gone to almost entirely variable. So Guelph uh, has a small connection charge, but it's mostly variable. And it really just, again, goes to what, what are your objectives? What are you trying to achieve? So if you really want to drive consumption down and you're not worried about variability, that you variability, you might want to go more uh, variable charge. If you want your, your water usage price to stand out, doesn't it make sense to have two rates? Like there has to be a cost rate for all the infrastructure. Here's how much it costs mm -hmm. just before the water goes through your meter. And then, the, then an identifiable rate for the water so that people know it's going to cost me $100 a month before I turn the tap on. And then I have the control. If it's all mixed up in the variable, it isn't a lot harder to. Uh, yes, it's harder for certainly harder for residents to to budget. Well, it can be harder for residents to budget. And they have to think more, which is kind of a point, right? Harder on my end. Yeah, hard definitely harder on your end because your variability, your revenue variability is going to change. The more variable, the more you depend on the variable component of the bill, the more your revenue will fluctuate. That is inevitable. And I'm going to talk more about how to deal with that very real problem. Again, Oliver said it best earlier, not a silver bullet. Challenges associated with this stuff, for sure. But is a connection charge include meter maintenance, meter reading, and meter billing? Can. Could. Yeah. Could. Um, well, that's kind of... Uh, that's that's price, there's a price in there. If you don't have a meter, there's no price in there. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, probably the better way of asking is, the, the more fuller way of asking is, how much of your capital cost should be captured in here? And that's a long story. And that's an important, it's an important distinction, just to, to emphasize that, that, that you want to probably, you don't need to, but you may want to capture your capital charges in some element because you want to create some stability. That's a sort of political decision and sort of ease of administration kind of decision. But there are a whole bunch of different ways you might think about that. Because as you capture more of your capital charges, the variable part gets smaller. So then the incentive and the signal to change behavior diminishes. So you have to balance the needs for administration versus the, the other objective, which may be to change behavior or to align your water budget in a more appropriate way. So that's part of the distinction. Again, we're not going to come here and say, you know, this ought to be 30% and that's going to be 70%. We're saying these two elements ought to be part of what you're considering and know why you're doing it. I think we're going to give you all the answers. <laughs> they were hoping for at least one. 20 minutes. They were hoping for at least one answer. I, I'd just like to clarify on the connection charge. We charge a connection charge just to hook up to the water. Yeah. And then we charge for the meter box and the stuff installation. That's a separate charge. And then are we talking connection charge on a monthly billing? Yeah. Okay. So, so terminology issue there. So like Mike would call it partial tax? No. 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 Uh, it's partial. There's frontage. There's yeah, like base rate. terminology base is, base is so we, exactly. So a connection charge would be your base rate, and then your variable would be the cost per meter. Yeah. So this doesn't change with consumption. This does. Yeah. So one's fixed. One fluctuate based on how much you use. And again, you can achieve. You can get to the same total either way, but. There's issues for revenue stability, and there's issues for how it will the the strength of the signal to the individual user. If it only makes a dime difference if I change my toilet or not, I'm going to hardly do that. But if it's a really significant, then I'm going to maybe change my behavior more. So that's the balance. This is 
And this is just the, this is this just captures that graphically, right? So you have a flat rate, which immaterial what quantity it is is how much. And then you have a couple of different rate structures you could use, again, probably pretty similar. But as you use more, you can have a constant rate. So a dollar per cubic meter, for example, that would be a constant rate. Whether I use a hundred or a thousand makes no difference. It's still a dollar per cubic meter. Or you can have something that's stepwise inclining. This could also be um, just a flat curve, but the idea that for each additional unit I use, that additional unit will cost me something more. So these are some of the, the standard sort of tech or images to capture what, what we're talking about there. And related to that is, there is a significant debate. And in fact, I think you won't find very many, if you put any mix of people in the room, there will be disagreement. There is the idea of using a uniform rate for all the reasons we talked about, administrative ease, that idea of, 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 of very straightforward kind of signaling versus something that's inclining. So the more you use, the more it, it costs. And the divide basically, uh, I, my sense is, splits between what I call the practitioners and the theoreticians. And so not surprisingly, Kirk and I don't necessarily agree all the time. Kirk being much more practically minded, me being much more concerned with, well, what, what are we trying to get at? What do we ought to try and do? And the economists say, well, what you want your water price to do is capture the marginal cost. How much does it cost to bring that extra unit? That user should get that signal and then they can make that decision. And if we all did that in a perfect world, we as a society would come up with the appropriate amount of water we would use. Well, that means you have to have a very sophisticated system where basically based on time of day, distance traveled, all these sorts of factors would enter to tell you how much that water use. That's not a very practical outcome. The practitioner would say, listen, I got, I'm the one that has to manage this. I have to put in the computer systems. I have to communicate it. I have to get my politicians on board with it. Something much more straightforward. And I think we've sort of come to learn to agree to disagree and sort of our compromise position is I don't know if you want to... Three. I say five. <laughs> but somewhere between three and five steps in a tiered system. Because I want the signal to the low water user to say, listen, I'm doing the right thing. And as I use progressively more, I get myself into different categories and I'm using more. It changes the whole dynamic about what technologies are available. And I don't think at that level it's that sophisticated to run. But the flip side... I think that when we have more than three tiers, it gets uh, into a point where we're unnecessarily complicating the system and complicating it from the, uh, the homeowner's point of view. So I think the simpler you can keep it from a, from a communication perspective, the better. And my approach, is preferred approach, is to have a, 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 a first tier being a low rate so that people's basic needs are covered. Then a, the next rate up is to kind of a higher rate to capture uh, people at, you know, the, the so-called discretionary use of the outdoor use and so on, and then a third rate that's up here for the, quote, water, water hogs. I know you're not on my side, though. <laughs> Me? Yeah, you. Well, no, I, 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 I think there are a few mentions that Mike, Mike, you know, I'm not sure, but we tended to agree initially. The fewer the blocks, the better, simpler. But when we... I think this is right, Mike. When we did this sort of initial practice, um, we were getting a message from the consumer that if there was too few blocks and if they went above that line, it jumped them into the next block for the whole amount, for a large portion of the consumption, which forced them into a higher, higher rate, which doesn't sound unfair. But the, the reaction was, it, it's not um, smooth enough. Mm -hmm. So you know, you're, you're right, you get to a point where suddenly your cost leaps into the next category instead of gradually passing through. So for that reason, I can't even remember how many blocks we've got. But we certainly have more. I think you've got. I think he's well, got a minimum rate right in six blocks. We used to have five, and we went to six after a lot of discussion with the public because just for reasons John just mentioned. Mm -hmm. They really don't like surprises, right? They don't like to uh, get into that upper rate and all of a sudden, because it's a warm few weeks, and they're all of a sudden paying $3 instead of $1.50 or whatever. They say, we don't have a problem with higher rates. In fact, higher the better, the water volume, and we'll talk about that this afternoon. But 
give us a gradual curve if you will. Fortunately, you've got Oliver on your side. I'm going to take a bit more convincing. But um, <laughs> the point is, I think, like, the takeaway for me is that you got to look at the local context, too. That's a big part of it. So the local politics, the consumption curve in your community is a big part of it. So, you know, if you've got a lot of water users that are at that high end, then maybe having more tiers is appropriate. And I mean, that's that piece, that what I call H2OIQ, right? People understanding what the water issues. You can have that conversation, but you need a sophisticated audience who's prepared to think about some of these problems. So the theoreticians would support what you're saying, exactly that, because what we're suggesting is we want to really signal that high water use is inappropriate, because the point of doing that is to be equitable. And if you have two sort of simple tiers, it's actually not that equitable. You're not really getting at what you want to be getting at. So that's the challenge. And I, I, again, there is no correct answer, believe me. What it is is to what extent, what's sellable, what's appropriate for your context, and what is something that you can make work. Because really, that's what we're talking about in Canada. We're trying to make a system where water pricing plays a role has to begin to work. We should clip along, but there's a couple of questions. I just had a quick question. In the book, it talks about lifeline, and you talked yeah. about what a person needs for a basic, yes. their basic needs. What is that amount? Can, can I come back to that? Really I'm, yeah, Good. I'm not going to tell you what the amount is. I'm going to tell you some ways you can figure it out. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I will tell you what it is because Good. the WHO <laughs> says it's 50 liters per person per day. 50 liters per That's person. the World Health Organization. Okay. Um, some sort of more standard sort of what would they call sort of developed country amounts is in the range of 80 liters per person per day. I think personally that seems high. But 50 is what I That's what the World Health Organization suggests. That's start, thanks. That's just... <laughs> <laughs> With the World Health Organization is 80? 50. 50. Well, who suggested 80? Not to throw too much of a monkey wrench into the North American American. regional district here has a, has a simple problem with the fancy pricing structure in that it's mostly residential. And then how do you get into the, you know, like the city of the memo, for instance, is largely, well, largely residential, but has a number of components that are commercial and industrial. Ironically, some of the commercial is selling ice and then filtered water. Uh, how do you how do you re reconcile that? I guess the economic development group in Nanaimo said, "Oh, we should you know, volume discounts," and, and the rest of us are saying, "No, no, no." But there's still an issue. Of high water use. We're um, we're definitely biased towards talking about residential here, just because it's it's most of it and it's easier. Um, but uh, that's kind of a long topic. It depends on whether you're talking about commercial, institutional, or industrial, which are all very different in terms of water consumption. The one thing I will say is uh, I think it's fairly widely agreed amongst e economist circles. You want to avoid cross-subsidization. So you don't want your, your resident, non-res sector subsidizing your residential sector. That's, that's key. So you know some form of standardization there uh, in terms of rates is important. You're not agreeing. Well, we're a small town in the party, yeah. and we have several fish plants. So if you raise the water costs for them too much, they're going to close the doors. And now, so now you're going to lose an industry, a ton of jobs, that kind of stuff. So, the so that has to be balanced somehow. The economists would say that's a great concept. It's very important. It ought to be just done transparently. You ought not do it behind closed doors. If you feel that's important, a society, a community thinks that this is an important economic development priority, they ought to be clear that that's what's happening and that's how they're doing it. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a, a classic uh, academic term, there's this thing called the Tietenberg Principle, which basically says for each policy tool, you can have only one policy outcome. So if you're trying to solve three problems at once, you can't expect one tool to do it. So what we're talking about is a sustainable infrastructure that begins to realign versus what you're talking about, which is an important issue, but it's local economic development. And we've really got to come along. Yeah, we're not going to finish this story. We can get a little bit of bonus time, right? Because right? we're answering questions. Exactly. And we're being exactly. interactive, right? Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, and I think people are engaged. Yes. So, no one's got their head on their desk. So. All right, what was that other question? Then? Was somebody else? I just wanted to say that things are changing. Our software, we're working with our software people because we're going to put meters in our residences starting next year. And one of the things that will be built in, we build every three months, but we'll read every month. Yeah. And if you want, you'll get an email. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So that's one, so that, so that when they get their bill, the tier doesn't give them a heart attack. Yeah. So that those kinds of things are starting 
to happen. It's just aiding what we're doing. Fantastic. And I mean, it's probably, you know, when you say things like that, it makes me realize that this conversation probably wouldn't have worked five years ago, but now people are kind of ready for it so that we can fill out the whole room and people are going to go towards the I want about. Um, so there's some other types of rates. Uh, I'm not going to go into them in too much detail, but excess use rates. So this is, you know, if people, it's another way of saying a really high tier, right? So people are consuming a, a high amount. Seasonal surcharges I'll come back to, uh, but that's adding a, a summer charge essentially. And if you've got monthly billing, like what you're talking about, all the better for that one. Distance rates, so this is, uh, you're charging people more if they're uh, having to have their services delivered spatially distantly. So um, with this one, you know, costs more to get water to, uh, uh, to the sprawl, or the urban sprawl, if you will. So you can charge based on that and make the price reflect the decision that people are making in terms of where they want to live. <coughs> Scarcity rates, so that's when you jack the price up when you're in a drought. Rarely done, but really effective, and can actually replace restrictions if it's done properly. Mm -hmm. And lifeline blocks, which I am going to come back to, and that's how, uh, so a basic amount. I'm going to suggest we don't spend a lot of time here, but page 19 is where that, those quick summaries and lots of information on that. Yeah. Elsewhere. Um, so why have I got Seattle here? Right, Seattle, great study in conservation pricing. They have been doing this stuff since the 80s, and as a result have seen consistent declines in per capita use. <coughs> they first introduced a seasonal surcharge in 1989, I believe. They've got a permanent tiered structure. And uh, at the highest rate of consumption in Seattle, so if you're at the top tier in their multi-tiered structure, you're paying $4 a cubic meter. Does that seem like a lot? Yeah. yeah now that's only for the top tier, right? Most people are paying less. But when you get up there, you've got a strong incentive. Keep it in mind, though, what else can you get delivered to your door? It's a four bucks cubic meter. <laughs> it's a thousand <laughs> liters of water. Four bucks. <laughs> and we're all going, wow. <laughs> and Seattle, Seattle's interesting, again, because this will be one of the overarching points that we're trying to make. It's not a silver bullet. They did not rely on price alone as part of a comprehensive package looking both at source, broader community education, other incentives and tools. What's interesting about Seattle is it's one of the, the sort of feature pieces, one of the flagships of how they are sort of trying to balance that water in, water out sort of conundrum or um, challenge, I guess. And um, what percentage of cost recovery are they? They're, are they in 10 or under they're, they're very close. I mean, again, it fluctuates because the U.S. system is similar where there's these sort of stimulus spending in the U.S. in fact sometimes a little more pork, bell, uh, pork barrel like. So, but, so there are these sort of infusions that happen, but they're, they're, they're very close to, to uh, a more sustainable, at least financial, financially. In fact, I'd probably argue they're about the closest you're gonna find because in Seattle, uh, they have uh, every four years, they have to, sorry, every two years, they have to do a cost of service study, which is a full cost accounting approach. They have to include all their costs in that, and they have to base their rate on that study. So that's built into their um, their governance framework. I'm not sure whether it's regulatory or policy, but um, so it is a definitely a full cost accounting system. There, um, probably you know well, much more robust than you're going to find in other places for sure. Um, and it's it's an interesting uh, you know comparison to um, the Lower Mainland where we've got you know very comparable kind of uh, in urban environment, similar water uh, characteristics in terms of climate and so on. Um, but you know we're sort of only just now starting to move in that direction here compared to Seattle, which is just you know like we can be there from Victoria, I can be in downtown Seattle in 40 minutes. It's such a different structure. Um, okay, so again, just simplifying a bit though, you know when you're thinking about all these things, like oh, inclined block and fixed charge and volumetric charge and scarcity rates, sur seasonal surcharge, blah 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 blah. Does the price accurately inform consumers about the cost of their water use and provide a signal that affects the city? That's the simple key thing you're working for. You know, on that one, uh, I can just give an example from uh, back east, large city. Um, everybody thought of the water as water in. And also in the municipal taxes, it was always on your taxes, your water. So it wasn't hidden in other taxes like some places do to kind of hide it. You want that out front. And in this area, suburb to Toronto, uh, overnight, uh, they said, you know, we got to charge for water out. Water rates double. You had in, you had out. 
And I think at that time, you think, look at the front load your washer. Ontario's the industrial hub. It drove innovation overnight to do those things because people weren't not seeing what it's cost them. They were seeing overnight it's doubling and they forced this innovation. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. you know, we probably should have made that point earlier. I think we kind of made it implicitly, but you know, to, well, we'll talk more about seasonal surcharges. But if you want to do it, we're not necessarily advocating doing it quickly, but if you want to do it quicker, volumetric wastewater charging linked to your, your water consumption. So a discharge factor of some kind, you know, like what your, your sewer charges are based on how much water you consume. Right? That goes to the issue we were talking about right earlier with the dish, uh, the washing machine and seasonal search. Yes. And you know, just another point, when you started off your conversation, for the first 20 minutes, I thought it was in a peak oil meeting mm -hmm. because all of those charts line up exactly with oil. You're right. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> but, <laughs> let's get distracted. Okay, let's get distracted. I get a question about that one of those. So these are the top three challenges. I actually think that there is a top one, one, top zero, which is in BC and in Canada, we don't have sufficient metering. That is the major challenge. You can't do this stuff without metering. And that's a whole separate conversation about that. But I just thought I'd throw that out there. Yeah, good, good so point. In here. Um, and I think, how many people think we need to be fully metered in this room? How many people are, who, who's against metering? No <laughs> one. <laughs> You're on the fence. The government's going to force that anyway. If you want to get grants for water, part of the build in there is going to be that you have to connect to metering. So that would help. Yeah. And if Wally's here this afternoon, he might find Okay, so let's talk about the big challenges. Um, so, life, uh, income impacts on low-income families. This is a real issue, and it is, if you go to change prices, is one you will invariably hear. But what about the pensioner? What about the single-income, uh, low-income family? Right? They can't take any more. So, I think whether you accept that as a legitimate issue or not, you are going to have to confront it. And I actually accept it as a legitimate issue. Water is an essential service, right? So we need to be cognizant of the impact that we're having on the most vulnerable members of our communities. There are, however, lots and lots and lots of ways to address this issue to the point that I would say that if you take it on uh, as it, you take it head on, you can <coughs> overcome this and you can actually make it better for that, um, that group. So the first way is to provide a lifeline block. So I think we've kind of covered this already, but a lifeline block is an amount that meets the basic needs of uh, a family for their basic uh, internal uses. How much is it? Maybe it's 50 uh, liters per person per day. Maybe it's 80 liters per person per day. Maybe you look at their winter consumption, or you look at winter consumption in your community, and think about it from that perspective. Right? Because obviously when we're looking at winter consumption, we're looking at just the internal use. So you can think about that amount and maybe a little bit less to incentivize um, improving indoor technology. But some variation on those basic ideas. And, and you should have that built in if you're going to a tiered system. The other thing you can do is you can have targeted rebates and giveaways. So if you've already got a, a rebate for toilets or washing machines in your community, and you're thinking about transitioning out of that, maybe for a while you want to make that income tested. So you only get it if you've got a certain, uh, you're below a certain threshold for income. Um, you can do educational things like, uh, um, you know, give people advice on how to save water in their homes, so that's kind of obvious. And in some cases, and I doubt that that would apply to, that probably wouldn't apply to anyone in this room, but in some cases, you can subsidize. And what that means is um, basically providing a levy on high consumption to uh, providing uh, rate relief for people that are in need. That's primarily only an issue for large urban areas. So you see it in the United States. But you know there is another side to this, which is everybody gets more control over their water bills when you make your price volumetric or more dependent on volumetric. So some people will actually see a reduction in their bills because they're conservatives. <coughs> I think the important point too is that what you don't want to do is have a poorly run water system because you're trying to solve a poverty problem. 
What you want to do is have a well-run water system and think about what you're going to do to resolve your poverty problem. And I think this next is it the next slide. What two slides? No, I'll, I'll come back to that. Yeah. So just another uh, quick case study. San Antonio's uh, another place that's got a long history with conservation. So that's the Alamo there. Anybody know what the Alamo looks like? Um, they've done at least four different programs to uh, help low-income people because they have a large uh, low-income population there. And there's also racial issues there because a lot of it's um, uh, Mexican uh, immigration um, issues. So um, they have, for example, a pro program called Project Aqua, which um, uh, provides um, uh, plumbers going in people's houses and retrofitting if they're below a certain income threshold. They've got something called Plumbers for People, where they'll send plumbers into a house to fix leaks. And most interestingly, they have a levy on uh, the highest tier of consumption, which is very high, and they use that levy to fund programs to provide efficient technology. In one year, they gave away 30,000, 30,000 low flow toilets through that subsidy program. So that's a lot of jobs, right? Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, that's an example of a place that's really taken on both the pricing issue and the low income issue and had good success. And just to give us a context of what we're talking about here, this is, this is the percent of your uh, water and sanitation bill for the lowest 10% of the population. So it's a very small amount of the very lowest percent. So the idea that uh, getting our water pricing a little better is going to be potentially terminal or ultimately destructive is a bit of a myth. It's one of those classic sort of arguments that's thrown out there, can easily be managed, and the scale and scope of the problem is not as huge as you might think. So again, an indication both of how relatively little we're charging for our water and also that there, this, this issue isn't as pressing as we may think. Okay, um, revenue stability, we've touched on this one a little bit already. <coughs> Excuse me, so this is the concern that, you know, if I go to volumetric pricing, uh, we're going to have a dry year, we're going to have to put watering restrictions in place, and my revenue is going to plummet because we're building money. Yes, real concern, <coughs> and people have run into strife around this. Okay. Cannot make this problem go away. If you go to volumetric pricing or, or increase your reliance on volumetric pricing, you will have more revenue very big. That is a gift. However, there's a few things you can do to manage it. First of all, uh, you want to be more innovative with your pricing, right? So you want to be thinking over multiple years so that you're collecting enough revenue to cover both high consumption years and low consumption years based on what's going on with the weather, how much people are watering their lawns, right? How do you know that? You look at your historical data. You look at comparable places. Um, yeah. Sure. Absolutely. You know, and then you're going to have to be a bit creative with that because you're going to be having to think, well, what's going to be happening with behavior as well? Are people going to be watering less? Right? The big thing there is the idea that we, what we're talking about when we say use innovative pricing mechanisms. The point is, you don't just you know sort of on a Tuesday decide up oh, innovative pricing mechanism and on Wednesday it's in. It's about planning. It's about building all these things, and that's really what I think this is code for, right? This is classic marketer <laughs> language for what we're saying is plan and really think ahead, and then you can start solving some of these problems. And I'll let you continue. Yeah. So um, you've got to do the planning, and, and so that's that's there's two sides on that, right? That's that's analyzing the demand, the community demand, what's happened historically, and what you think is going to happen in the future, incorporating things like climate change technology change, uh, building code changes, all that kind of stuff, uh, housing density, all that. Um, and also uh, modeling your anticipated future capex, your capital expenditure in the future. You gotta take all that into consideration. People that don't plan this stuff are the ones that run into stuff. Um, okay, I think this is the biggest problem. Um, you know, <laughs> metering's a problem, this is the bigger problem. I think. Um, and so, uh, this is the hardest one because there is, this is a political issue. People see what we're talking about as a euphemism for increased taxes. 
because we're public entities providing a lot, most of us are public entities providing water services, it's just seen as another form of taxation. Right? Government's taking more of my money. And so uh, politicians and senior leaders in uh, water service providers have very good grounds for uh, fearing that there's going to be winners and losers, there's going to be nasty stuff in the newspaper, and why would they want to go near that? And that is the toughest issue to address, and it's exacerbated by what we are familiar with, the myth of abundance that we've got in with water supplies. But we're not talking about the water, we're talking about providing the water service. The only way through this one is just like any other political debate, is to get your key messages right and get out there and win their hearts and minds as best as you can. Okay? So this is a communications exercise. I'm not going to go through all these key messages because they're in the book on page one right at the beginning. But this is stuff your communications department or whoever does your press releases can use. And the key one, I think, is the first one, which we've talked about a few times here. This is both financially and environmentally the right thing to do. And if you consistently make that message, you might win. Let's go back one, and that's probably my favorite one. I think it's that many other places are successfully doing it. So we're not talking about something that's uh, sort of uh, you know, untested processes. There are lots of places doing it, doing it well, helping them achieve the goals. So it is not too difficult for any given community to do. Yeah, but don't sure, let's not sugarcoat this, right? You've got to win a political fight if you're going to if you're going to take this on. Another component of it is to think about the time frame you're going to do it over, right? So we'll talk more about that because I think this is the long road that we're talking about. Okay, um, so we've been uh, criticized for um, not spending enough time in this presentation on the actual implementation of it, right? But um, kind of have to give you the first bit to get into that. And I think we're going to talk more about that this afternoon anyway. So what I will say is there's a lot more detail on this in the primer. One, two, this is, this is local specific. So you really have to think about this in your local context. <coughs> um, but these basic elements are consistent. First of all, have a plan and have that plan be over more than one year. year. The places that have implemented um, extreme price changes really quickly are the ones that have run into problems in, in, in my experience. So you know, think about this over multiple years, maybe five, maybe more. Related to that though is also you need to, this isn't just for the water managing, most of us here are water managers, it's not just a water manager's challenge. You need to recruit the aid of the senior folks, the politicians, there has to be sort of an internal dialogue and consistent messaging to have the sort of uh, fortitude and courage to bring it forward. So that planning process is almost tiered. You want to talk about it from an organization, and then you want to talk about what that organization plan will be bringing forward. So you want to recruit that aid. Okay, and a lot of this other stuff we've talked about, get metered, charge by volume, get your head around your water use in the community, fully account for expenditures, so that's that full cost accounting piece. Seasonal surcharges are an excellent way to start, by the way. Um, we touched on this already, but it's one you can introduce fairly quickly that people can get their head around. Oh, I use more water in the summer. It's going to be more expensive. <coughs> Helps if your billing cycle is more regular than not. So if you've got yearly bills or every six months, that one's harder. Um, we'll talk about this more, make it part of a complete program so it's not just pricing, it's pricing plus other things as part of a holistic water conservation framework and getting the aid of senior government, which I know we're also going to talk more about. Guelph. Um, Guelph paying two bucks a cubic meter now, which is reasonably high by Canadian standards, not at the top end. But they've implemented uh, significant price increases, increases over the last few years, 19% price increases in the last few years. And what's interesting is that there's been very little public resistance to that. And I think it's mostly because they consistently made this message financially the right thing to do, environmentally the right thing to do. So they won their audience that way. Um, senior government has an important role in this. Um, there's uh, a bit in the primer on it, but um, they can do things like link infrastructure grants to conservation. Somebody in the room talked about that a few minutes ago. Um, they can uh, create policies that facilitate making the change so that you don't have to sell it to the community. You can tell people you had to do it. So for example, encouraging universal metering. 
and they can remove legislative barriers, things like uh, prohibitions on retaining surpluses, the quote, non-profit requirements. So if you can retain a surplus, you can use that in years when people are using less water. So each of these bullets are from a look sort of globally of what different jurisdictions have done. There's a whole bunch of things they could do, but these are things that have been used and are used successfully. And this is back to my point that I'm saying, you know, the world of senior government, the provinces and the feds, their role in infrastructure financing is going to change. So they're going to get out of the dollars game and play probably more of that sort of a game. The sort of, what are the individual pieces that they can help fix? What is the barrier that's the problem here? Is it a place where revenue stability is going to be a big concern, in which case they could potentially make a sort of a, a low interest fund available to ensure that you keep your, your, your finance on the right track? There's a variety of ways, but that's an important point. Yeah, and I think we've made these points already. You know, it's a long-term proposition. Um, it's, it's part of the toolbox, not the whole toolbox. There's lots of resources out there. We've got some in the room today. Um, Water Bucket's a fantastic resource. It's got tons of information on there. If you can't find it, it's probably on there. You just haven't found it yet. You can phone Kim. Um, at home. <laughs> at home, <laughs> anytime, 24-7. Um, and, uh, and Nanaimo's got some good stuff on like kind of the local context, uh, the Team Water Smart stuff, which I'm assuming a few of you in the room are part of that program already. You know, there's some really good resources coming into that, too. And this is my, uh, my, my two-second pitch here, because part of our program is to, th to think about what are some of these emerging issues. And I think the, you know, this is a separate discussion, but the idea that infrastructure is more than just the pipes in the ground is an important part of what we're talking about. Conservation programs, uh, robust financial systems, an educated community who understands when a drought comes that water behavior needs to change, that's all part of infrastructure. Healthy source water is all part of infrastructure. And that's sort of the flip little title there, Thinking Beyond Pipes and Pumps. And that's a resource that we have and with a couple of others that sort of captures what some of these elements might be. And there's some probably at the back, if not on our website. So on that note. Yep, we got it. Aren't they great? You kind of, you know, to compliment your first slide, you know, dumber, dumb and dumber, dumber, you kind of change it. We used to have an ending slide which is smarter and smarter, I think. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> anyway, um, it was really great the way you, you got talking to the audience, because that's why I was kind of watching the time. Really. You can talk about this, whether it was going to be a straight lecture, or whether, depending on how you started reacting to it, I guess you got us going, just how the group started to interact. But we do want to make this effort to have what we would call the town hall interaction where we, we actually get to interact a bit more. And so, uh, John, maybe you'll have to keep an eye on the time because we've only got 15 minutes now. Give me the heads up, right? Yeah. But in terms of how to frame this next 15 minutes, just pose this question to you. What is your reaction to what you've just heard? And what do you wonder now? And I'd like to kind of draw out some of the people who, um, who didn't ask questions. You know, what's, what's going through your mind right now? I could pick on Douglas Anderson. I could pick on